Welcome to Nita's Excerpts from the Experts, brief learning sessions with researchers and practitioners in the field of eating disorders and families and individuals who share their experiences and perspectives. I'm your host, Sarah Bowie Keaton. This week, our guest is Dr. Norman Kim. He is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the Center for Practice Innovation at Columbia Psychiatry and co-founder of the Institute for Anti-Racism and Equity, a social justice consultancy. He has his PhD in psychology and over 20 years of experience in eating disorders, tech startups, and advocacy focusing on health equity and anti-racism. Today, Dr. Kim will be speaking about eating disorders in BIPOC communities. Dr. Kim, welcome to our program. Oh, it's my pleasure, happy to be here. So in what ways might eating disorders present differently in people from BIPOC communities? Yeah, you know, I think that's such an important question. I think historically we've looked at eating disorders in a particular way um, as something that I think even within the healthcare community as something that primarily affects, you know, young, um, young white women. And many of our criteria, many of our assessment instruments have really reflected that. Um, what I think is not captured is what we've more recently come to understand as the uh, greater variety of presentations within within um, different folks who have eating disorders and all of the different ways that eating disorders present as we've gotten more, more sophisticated in our understanding of the element. So for example, in the populations that I tend to work with in BIPOC populations, um, eating disorders might not necessarily show up as somebody who has a particular preoccupation with thinness or with dieting behavior per se. Because eating disorders at their core aren't necessarily just about wanting to look a certain way. Eating disorders at their core really come from a place of feeling, um, feeling lesser than and not as good as other people and defective in some way. And when you're somebody who has an identity that's marginalized, when you're somebody who has an identity that's been minoritized, and all of the things that go along with that status, the, the behavior and the specific ways that something like an eating disorder might present can be a little bit different. So for example, it might show up in um, changing other elements of yourself to, um, to be more reflective of sort of what our society deems as, as the ideal, which is really typically sort of what we see represented in media, for example. And that's rarely people of color because all of those things have meaning in our culture and all of those um, elements of our appearance aren't just about vanity or just about appearance. They signal something important about status in our culture. So I think this is something that, that the eating disorder community is starting to understand a little bit better is that there, is many, there are many more elements of, of um, uh, there are many more elements of what people struggle with that go well beyond just thinness, that go beyond you know, wanting a certain kind of body that I think really needs to be much more incorporated into the way that we practice, into the way that we assess, and ultimately into the ways that we treat this illness in people. So what are some of the existing barriers to receiving care for people from the BIPOC communities? Yeah, I think one of the most important barriers is um, the lack of representation largely within healthcare, but particularly within the eating disorder treatment world. Uh, but the lack of representation in our treatment centers, walking into a treatment center and feeling like there are not necessarily going to be people treating you or working with you in whatever capacity, who have some understanding of your life experience, who have some understanding of the complexities of your life experience having to do with your identity. And that's such an important thing because if you think about, you know, think about any of us who might need to seek um, treatment for something serious, or, or even if it's not terribly serious, um, but just going to seek treatment from, from anybody about anything. It takes a tremendous amount of courage. It takes a certain amount of vulnerability. There is often a lot of shame attached to talking to a stranger or to a professional about what you might be struggling with. And all of those things require a sense of safety, require us, regardless of what kind of co context we're working in, it, it, you know, if I walk into my doctor's office, I need to feel a sense of safety, regardless of what I'm talking to my doctor about. I need to feel in some way that whoever is going to be talking to me is going to understand who I am. It's impossible for someone to understand 
all intersectionalities of all people. Um, I understand what you're saying with having practitioners that um, you can identify more closely with, and that might be difficult to find, but at least if the training for practitioners is uh, cultural humility and competence, um, hopefully that's in the training programs. Um, I think as long as they're asking the right questions and trying to create a safe space where they feel listened to, they're heard, um, that's definitely a step in the right direction. But you're right, there is a shortage, I think, of practitioners where there's um, shared identities with a lot of the people that are being treated. And that is a barrier. Yeah. And you know what you're saying is so important. The, um, you know, there's there's definitely been more um, more attention paid from all of our professional organizations on getting the kinds of trainings that you're talking about. Um, and you know, on the one hand, more and more people are getting those kinds of trainings. Um, and you know, I th I think if we the other element of this is that people who are seeking treatment for themselves as clients, um, family members of somebody who is seeking treatment or who needs treatment or who needs help of any kind, support, whatever um, whatever kind of support that someone might need. Um, that, you know, I think it's also important for, for, um, for us as professionals to reinforce the idea that you know, the consumer, the person who's actually going to be receiving the services absolutely has every right to um, to be good consumers and to ask important questions of us. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily been a part of how we've looked at healthcare, again, generally. You know, most of us don't don't think about questioning our 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 treatment professionals on, you know, their on their background or on their understanding or on, you know, what kinds of clients they might typically see. But I think those are really important questions, especially for something as complex as eating disorders are. Uh, so my last question is, um, do you have three key takeaways for our listeners today? Yeah, my first key takeaway is something that I've actually been, you know, I've, I've been in this world for a long time. It's something I've been particularly impressed with, um, you know, the, the community of people who struggle with this illness is that, uh, you know, I do think sort of in line with what we were just talking about, I do think many people um, who are struggling with this illness um, are are in many ways far more educated about the illness than the average person is about what they might be struggling with. You know, most of the people I've worked with are much more well-versed in this illness than I am with any of the things, especially as I get older, any of the problems that I, you know, I, I sort of struggle with. Um, and I think that's actually, that's on balance a really good thing. A second important takeaway is, you know, don't be afraid to ask those questions. I think there's we we don't we don't give enough credence to our guts, you know, for for lack of a better word here. Maybe a little bit more of a challenge than a takeaway um, for um, for providers is to you know such an important element of being a provider, regardless of what issue you're talking about, is to understand um, where um, understand the limits of of our the limits of our experience and our, our, you know, our training, our, um, our backgrounds, et cetera. Just as we would expect somebody who is, is not proficient in eating disorder treatment, if they, if they encounter somebody who needs that specific treatment, that they would hopefully say, you know, I think you should really go, I can help you find somebody who's got more, much more experience in treating this illness, because that's not what, you know, that's not where my expertise is. I think that um, we ought to feel comfortable enough around these issues, even though they're much more complicated issues of racism, issues of, you know, of, of homophobia or transphobia as they come up. Um, and, you know, these are very, very personal issues, for, you know, regardless of who you are. I think we need to be more comfortable in saying, you know, I, I understand that's um, something that's going to be really important for you to have as a part of your overall treatment. And let me help you find somebody who it has more of a background than that. Listening to you, it just it sounds like for you personally, and what you would hope for most practitioners is to be practicing humility. The fact that you invite Absolutely. people to advocate for themselves, ask questions, and for you to feel comfortable saying, you know what, I'm not feeling proficient in this. I'm not proficient in this area. Let me refer you to someone who can help you more. And that level of humility is so important across the board. And it. 
I, I think it's something that we really, um, it, that's so important for all of us to be more mindful of. Well, you're ending on a great note. Thank you so much for your time today. It was wonderful listening to you and hearing your perspectives. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Nita's mission is to support individuals and families affected by eating disorders and serve as a catalyst for prevention, cures, and access to quality care. Nita offers programs and services designed to help you find the help and support you need. Whether you have been personally affected by an eating disorder or care about someone who has, recovery is possible and we're here to support you.